Hi, I hope you all can hear me. Very welcome to this evening with Peter Lynch. My name is Jacob Wicklander and I am a part of the board of the Stockholm's Architektförening who is organizing this evening. And I will just very briefly take the opportunity to inform our coming events. Uh, Next Thursday, uh, on March uh, 17th, about Kunskapshuset in Gällivare that is going to be presented by the architects Jonas Hermansson and Lars Olansson together with the textile artist Britta Markat Labba. Following on that, on March 24th, we have a visit from Ireland, O'Donnell and Tommy. And I think we have some visiting students here tonight as well. Uh, so just keep coming, listen on Thursdays. We organize this every Thursday. Uh, we guarantee you it's always something interesting. You don't even have to check the program. Just come, have a glass of wine, <laughs> enjoy the lecture, contribute to the creating the culture of architecture in Stockholm and a continued discussion about architecture. Uh, so now to Peter. Peter is a US registered architect, although he is now a guest professor and researcher at KTH School of Architecture. His Stockholm practice building culture PLC is focused on new methods of timber construction and applied research in the fields of architectural landscape and design. Peter graduated from Cooper Union in 1984. He apprenticed with Stephen Hall, opened his own office in New York in 1991, and directed the graduate architecture department at Cranbrook Academy in Michigan in 1996 to 2001. He has taught at Harvard, Columbia Uni, Rhode Island School of Design, City College of New York, Parsons, the New School, among many others. Besides his current guest professorship at KTH, he received a 2021 Vinova grant for Timescape Garden, which is an ongoing research project in Norrköping. A big hand and very welcome, Peter Lynch. Thank you so much for coming. I know there's so many things happening in Stockholm every week. Every, uh, Thursday every week, and uh, it's a great honor that you decided to come. Uh, and a special thanks to uh, the uh, Stockholm Architecture Framing and to Jakob for handling the arrangements so well. And I felt uh, so treasured by the way you handled everything. And thanks also to Elizabeth, who is part of the committee, Elizabeth Hatz, part of the committee that organizes the lectures. So. Um, I'm going to talk about a big arc of things. And so we have to jump right in. And, uh, the arc will go back to those uh, dates that were mentioned, the uh, uh, 80s. And maybe part of the interest will be for some to get a, a bit of a view of another architectural culture. And, um, and then, uh, obviously, of a kind of arc. So. I just start with a little prologue, and then I'll go through these different parts. Some are short, so it shouldn't look too intimidating. Um, and the key word is going to be this word, singularity, the singular. And if you fault the lecture by saying, my God, it's just the same word over and over, that is because I think it's a, it's a very, very precise word. And it helps to make differentiations that uh, if, we, if we choose a different word, we'll go in a different direction. So this word, in a way, the lecture is about this word and its relationship to architecture. So, uh, and you can see the various parts. So we begin with this first uh, introduction. So in 1989, I read an essay by the uh, urban designer Manuel de Sola Morales. And, uh, he wrote an essay in, in uh, uh, 
uh, one of the architecture magazines called Another Modern Tradition. And he proposed that, that besides the kind of heroic modern tradition of urban design that, that we know, CIAM is like the shorthand version, there were at least one other path that had architects like JGP Oud and Berlog and in more modern times, Arc to Siza, Alvaro Siza, and to Roberto Colova. And these represented a different attitude towards the city. Not about what the city should be, but about what the city is. And what uh, Sola Morales wrote that struck me was that, uh, that they began with an affection for the city. I thought, God, this is exactly what we need to do. We have to begin with affection. So what, is, what are the roots of affection? That's kind of the introduction here. Um, the, I told you we we're going to talk a lot about this word, this term, singularity. And by the way, I just have to say at the beginning that in astrophysics, in pop culture, techno speak, there's singularities. This is a different use of the word, and this is just unfortunate. So we're not talking about black holes or that kind of singularity. We're talking about the word as used by a number of philosophers um, who were part of an uh, ongoing conversation between them, Jean-Luc Nancy and, um, and Agamben, Giorgio Agamben. And uh, they basically uh, framed the term this way. Agamben, in his uh, art article, a small book, Coming Community, he says that uh, you don't have affection for someone because of the category they belong to. You know, uh, I don't love someone because they're Swedish or they're blonde. Uh, no, but for who they are. And that, that idea of affection is tied to the idea of the singular. I love this person for who they are. I love Stockholm for what it is. I have affection for Stockholm, partly because it is a singular place. That means that it's not an idea of a city. It doesn't copy any other idea, and it's certainly not a, a template, it's not a type. It's itself, and it's content to be itself. And somehow that contentment, you can see in the attitude of everyone who has affinity for that city. And so part of the attraction is the singularity. Another part is to things that are shared, like for instance, uh, here the Melloran. Everyone can look out over the water. This is something that's shared, and that shared Reality holds that open, holds the waterway open. Now, the singularity of a city can arise in many ways. It's not just, as uh, Rossi would perhaps say, the primary elements or the uh, monuments. It could be something as small as the way buildings meet the ground or the way that uh, sound bounces off the walls you know, of a building and buildings in Midtown. This is also what one can have, can, can point to as a kind of a s aspect of their singularity. And uh, when Elizabeth Hatz and I were teaching, uh, we gave a number of assignments to students to look at this kind of intimacy. For instance, uh, this is a student, Pontius Restad, who uh, had a sense of humor. You can see that in his drawings. He, he found this place in North Sherping where there was this negotiation that had to be made between the, the level of the ground, the level of the building. And in some ways, we're saying that this is characteristic, but not, again, not as a type. And we, I made the error of presuming that this was a kind of a typological study. So you can have affection for a city for its singularity and for its commonality. And now, I, I do have, think of myself as being from New York. Uh, now, New York isn't a beautiful city. The, the buildings are not what most people really care about. But the block is very interesting. The street widths are different, east, west, north, south, very peculiar. Uh, 
And the streets are held open by the activity of movement. And this is explicitly true because there's one little street in Manhattan right in front of uh, Rockefeller Center. The owners of that street have to close it one day a year. Because if they forget to close it, it will fall into the common. It will become part of the common property of the city. So the act of keeping it open is what makes it the commons. And Central Park is the most glorious commons. When Olmsted designed the park, he, he was insistent there should be no gates. The park cannot close. And although, and <clears throat> you know, there's this idea, God, it's dangerous, don't go to Central Park at night. Every New Yorker I know goes, goes to Central Park whenever they want to. It doesn't matter, three o'clock in the morning in a snowstorm. It's open. And that openness is its attribute. And it doesn't even have to be special. It could be a wind, another city can have a windswept field full of piles of construction debris, and it will be open, the commons. So again, I'm not trying to make it into something necessarily, something glorious. The commons can be something quite simple. And then there are other attributes that would make a city, you would have affection for a city. So we don't have to go through them all, but you can see that there's these two words, the singular and the common. And since 1983, I have been wondering about something. And uh, it's kind of shocking, I guess, to have a question for that long. Uh, but this is it. And, and other times it was phrased in other ways, because like I said, the word singularity is kind of a breakthrough when I came across the Giorgio Agamben uh, book, essay. So the question is, how can singularities, singular beings, form relationships, hold together, form a community? And in Swedish, I think uh, the question would be, how can all things hang at a hope? How does it hold together? Uh, in its singularity, okay? We know how to hold things together with order, with discipline, with structure, right? And that is an aspect of architecture, of course. I'm just not gonna talk about that aspect today, and it's not to denigrate it, of course. But is there an architecture of singular things, presences, they don't, they don't really, they're not co-fraternal, co they're not in the same category. They don't really care about their category. How do they hold together, okay? That's the question. And then form a community, okay? Now this is the interesting thing. I see that in Swedish there's no word for community. When I hear uh, people I admire like uh, Per Johansson and Eric Schult talking about uh, different aspects of philosophy, when they come to questions of community, they have to use the English word. So we'll use that, and it is Maybe it's got problems, you know, community relations, you know, it means many things. But the word commune and the idea of the common, common is embedded in community. So this is the question we talk about for an hour. Okay, now, how does this emphatic whateverness of uh, whatever is singular, in other words, the fact that it doesn't subordinate itself to a category. That means it doesn't lend itself to a place within a structure or a discipline, right? So um, if you didn't want to use the word singular, you could use other words. You could say essence, personality, or character, uh, Thusness, right? There's a lot of words, and like I said, each one will send you in a different direction. So the choice of words is very important. So um, now if we chose the word individuality, uh, as Per Johansson said once, uh, it's not a good choice. Uh, because individuality is just the quality of not being able to be further divided. Now in the US you can buy individually wrapped slices of cheese. I hope you can't get that here. But literally every cheese is in its own plastic wrapper, completely isolated from other cheeses. Therefore, it's an individual cheese. But it's exactly the same as every other piece of cheese. 
So that's not a good choice. And then we have the idea of uh, the idea of character, the idea of personality. And there's thanks to my friend Elizabeth Yanagasawa. There's a, she's pointed out a line of philosophy that even is saying that the question of personality is the key question in philosophy. Uh, kind of audacious. Why do they say that? Because Personality is also indigestible, like uh, singularity. You can't digest it. It's the remainder. It's what's left over. And, uh, and uh, different philosophers, including Bergson, they point out that philosophy deals with generalities. So where's the philosophy that will deal with, they use the word, personality? Okay, now I'm just going to quickly say why I think that singularity is a different branch because to have a personhood, to, have a, to be a person, a personhood, you need, you need self-coherence, integrity. You need to be self-witnessing. You have to have a will, right? That's a person. That's a character. Um, singularity, to be singular is much easier. You can slip around things. Yes. Yes. Uh, because there's no requirement of self-witnessing or even of coherence. And the, the example that's used in a lot of philosophical uh, discussion by Agamben and by uh, Isabel Stungers is this character from a Melville novel called uh, Bartleby the Scrivener. And this is this guy who sits in the back of the office. And he, he, everyone doesn't really know what he's doing there. Why is he there? They ask him, you know, can you do something? Can you cut? Well, I prefer not to. And so he just sits there, and in his passivity, in his inoperability, he actually uh, uh, establishes his singularity. So in the word singularity keeps open the idea of the inoperable, what they call in uh, Chinese wu wei, action by non-action. So I think that it leads in a different direction. Now for someone like Antonio Negri, who is a communist, the question I asked, what is the, in a good way, I'm not trying to use it pejoratively, what is the um, relationship between singularity and the common? Eh, no problem, it's an easy answer. It's the common project. This idea that we, as singular entities, could come together for a project. And uh, my friend and I, Richard Lamuto, who I'm gonna talk a lot about, we call this temporary society. And uh, Madeleine Hatz, uh, the painter, told me once about uh, temporary autonomous zones, right? I think it's the same idea, okay? But again, Negri is on the side of homo faber, right? That man works, makes, right? Bartleby the Scrivener, he, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> he probably wouldn't even collect his pension because it's too much work. So. Uh, homo faber doesn't encompass this whole question of community. And uh, so that's something I think that I'm always trying to point towards and, and uh, prod. So this is him saying that, well, what do, uh, what do singularities have in common? Common projects. And I can think the example that always comes to mind to me is the last part of Faust, Goethe's Faust. Faust is finally happy because he's invented a situation where millions of people have to fight to keep the ocean from going over the, the seawall and inundating their land. They are free because they have a common enemy. And that is, I guess that is that is a community, right? We can see what's happening in the news. We can see the power of an instantaneous community brought together by this common crisis, right? But I would find it tragic to think that that model is the only model. So now we're going to look at the testimony of a world composed of singular things, 
from painting, okay? And we'll also look at literature. But first, I just want to make things clear, okay? What, what is an example? What is singular? Places are singular. And um, I had a marvelous conversation with a, a filmmaker, Ingrid Reeser, in her podcast, uh, uh, Forest of Thought. And so maybe it's not necessary to talk a lot about that here, because we talked a lot about that, that places are singular. Uh, presence, a mood, circumstances are always singular. Experiences, encounters, anything that has a proper name is singular. So the architects, we should be, our eyes should be going right to this, circumstances. That's what we deal with, circumstances. What isn't singular? Typologies, commodities. I won't even read the whole list. I think you get the idea. And then what are we talking about when we say a holding together of singular entities, okay? A historical city is that for sure. There was no system. A landscape is that. There was no plan. A still life is what I'm going to say can be that. A potion. If you read these potions, like uh, uh, Madeline Hatz and I are reading uh, The Dream of the Red Chamber, this incredible novel, Chinese novel. Uh, and they have a description of a potion. It's one drop of the first dew appearing on the first day of summer from the first plant that grows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to make it have uh, the power, its potency, it needs to be composed of singular ingredients. Now, I have a long time frame. We're talking about my own history in a way. Um, is a Spanish architect, and he introduced me to this painter, Cotan. Cotan was a monk. He painted in early, uh, around 1600. Um, he painted, uh, for instance, what's called a cardoon and these parsnips. Now, why, what's going on here, right? Why is this so powerful? To me, it's powerful. I would never forget this. I remember the moment that he showed the slide when he was giving a lecture at Columbia. So, um, keep going here. Sorry. Now, the emergence of the still life in North Europe, it's an interesting story because the first still lives to have what they're now called inverted still lives because look in the upper right there, you can see something going on. Those are figures. That's Christ and Mary on the fleeing to Egypt. Okay, it's a biblical story. And here we have uh, Mary and Martha, in the you know, Christ in the house of Mary and Martha in the back there. Okay, now you can read a lot of rather... Um, questionable theories that say that they were just making an apology. They wanted to draw the fruit. They wanted to draw the, the meat, but they needed to throw in a little religious uh, uh, you know, content. Oh, God. These are religious paintings. What is the painter witnessing that through, through that immediacy of this, this very lemon and this very light bouncing off this piece of pewter, that we have a tunnel back to our historical arc, right, for a Christian in the Christian tradition. We are part of that arc, that story. So it's a tunnel through. And we see it through the experience of the things. And now in Perrin, uh, Perrin Eric Schultz's uh, podcast, which I bring up because I think many of you have listened to them, they talk about a uh, shoemaker in, uh, I think in Germany, around exactly the same time. His name's uh, Jakob Boehme. And how he's in his house, and the light reflected off of a pewter vessel, and boom. He saw what he conceived to be 
you know, not subjective reality. So there was testimony through that light and that vessel and that situation. Now, you, the question I'm asking you as architects is, what do you think? Do you think the vessel had anything to do with it? Did the light have anything to do with it? This is the key question for us. Because if it has nothing to do with it, then what I'm talking about is of no value for us. Because if it was just in Jakob Boima's head, or if it could have been any old constellation of things, then the arrangement of things has no relevance for this, this recognition, okay? But if the way things are organized has even a little bit to do with how things can be recognized in their singularity, then we have, we are implicated in this task, okay? And another thing I want to say about it is, it's not an encounter. I use that word, and then last night I woke up thinking, no, that's the wrong word. This is absolutely the wrong word. An encounter is when I talk to you, I face you, face to face. But this is not what's happening with reality. The sun is streaming in off the copper kettle, off the pewter vessel. It's beaming in. It's not in any need of affirmation. So in the Spanish still lives, there are a few that are absolutely incredible. And I show you two by the same artist. I always want to name who, who does these incredible things. And... Um, This isn't. It's not Kotan, it's not Cerberan. Jan van der Heemen was actually Spanish, apparently. So, my eye goes right to this vessel in the middle, and I see the, I see the harmony of the rings, of the donuts and the pastry and the thing. And now, if we take apart this, I just want to ask you, if they were obviously organized, to be in relation. Would it have any power? No. It's that it happens to be so. It happens to appear that way. If they were organized in a grid, if they were, uh, there was no depth, if there was no difference of light and dark, would there be this power? And my feeling is no. And uh, for instance, you look at the still lives by Chardin, I don't feel the same. I think they're pretty. They're pretty pictures, which is a huge put down within the world of painting. So there's something to the way this is done. That's good news for us, I think. Because what is our job? Our job is to arrange things. Now, I give you two examples from Remembrance of Things Past, okay? Uh, an enormous book. Everyone here, read this book. <laughs> It'll take a long time, but I remember when I was the first day at Cooper Union, an assistant to, to the dean said to me, you have to read this book. So I'm trying to pass on that advice. The book is testimony about many things, and we understand it in a certain way of popular culture, that it's about deciphering social codes and uh, understanding how the world works and understanding how memory and time work. But there's moments in the novel, now and then, when Proust is honest enough to give us situations that can't be decoded. This story he describes, bam, he's walking. I can imagine this in places where we live. He sees a chicken on a roof reflected in the pond and the feathers of the chicken float away in the, in the summer breeze. And bam! He knows this is important. He can't say why. The words he uses in, in, in English, uh, in, 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 in French, it's zut, 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 zut. But uh, we could say, holy God! And that's all you have to say, right? It's not about decoding it. And it's so interesting that in a book that's all about decoding, that there are these incidents that are not decodable, okay? 
And if you were going to criticize and say, well, this isn't real, Proust made this up. Well, again, this is good news for us. We are making things up. That's what we do. We make things up in reality. So if when you read this, you feel like, I understand, I get this, I, I know what he's saying, then that means that you as an architect can also realize this for other people. So I want to give another example that's even more important for the, for the maker, the artisan. Okay, there's another made up story. In there. They're all made up stories, of course, in the novel. It's about uh, an art critic, Bergotte and his death. Someone tells him that in the Vermeer painting, um, View of Delft, there's a little patch of yellow paint that's painted so incredibly well that you, you're just shocked by it. You're like floored by that little patch of yellow paint. So the guy, he goes and read, he goes, and he sees the thing and he sees the painting for the first time. Now what does he see? Does he see Delft? No, he sees the yellow pigment and the way it's applied. And again, this is good news for us because it's not about representation. It's not about authenticity of representation, which you could assume from the still life examples. So someone who is a contemporary painter who is not interested in representation can engage reality through the paint. The paint is real. So. And so beautiful what he says, the last thing he says before he dies, you know, he, has, he kills over. I should have done work like that. God, I'm so stupid. I didn't understand that it's about the yellow paint. Then he drops dead. So, and there is no yellow paint in the painting. It doesn't exist. You can look, you can search. I looked through the whole thing, you know, on high res Wikimedia Commons image. Proust invented this. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a little story, okay? A little example. Do you remember when you came in, there was a video playing? Did you see it? It was just a little film of. Uh, a courtyard in Bologna in 1989, exactly when the Tiananmen Square happened. I, I was in Bologna that summer. And I was making films of different parts of this city. And each one was an eight millimeter film. Camera was stationary and I ran the whole roll, you know, didn't move the camera. And so um, I thought, okay, if we have something to do as architects, we have something to do with this testimony of reality, I want to know in what situations it arises and in what situations it doesn't. Okay, so I'm going to take films of different places. This was the second place, okay? It's a little park on the northern outskirts of Bologna, okay? And here, I just click through a few frames, okay? A car passes by, the curtain blows, and you see the playground equipment turns around. That's all that happens, right? Nothing happens. Just like in Vermeer, that painting, nothing is happening in the view of Delft. This is why Proust picked it, because it's not telling a story. Okay, so look, then what I did, I photographed a white, this is pre-digital approach. <laughs> I photographed this white ring against the black background, made slides, I moved the ring, I made a hundred slides, the ring is in every possible place within the field of view of the, you know, I masked it off. So you just end up with a ring. I played the film, the different films, and I projected randomized auto advance slides on a carousel of a hundred. And what I was asking myself is, does it make sense? Now, when you listen to music, you don't know the next note that's coming if you haven't heard the piece. But after you hear it, it makes sense. That means there's some kind of holding together, right? Uh, some kind of holy hope, of aria tone. So that's what I'm asking. Did it hold together? And of course, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of that, that uh, painting 
uh, right? Because I'm not just projecting on, I'm adding to, I'm adding something to that still life in the experiment. And it was definitely possible to say that the first image, the first film you saw when I came in, nothing happened, it made nothing. You projected the rings on the thing, and maybe it hit something, and maybe it didn't, and it didn't have any significance to me. And we're talking about at an emotional level, not an intellectual level. But here, there was a sense, like you could hear the whisper, you could hear a faint music. Something was possible. And then I can ask myself, why? What is the quality of this space? Why does this lend itself to a kind of testimony of reality, right? And uh, others don't. Well, one thing we can say is, there's depth. I see things and I can imagine the space behind them, right? Like that gate, the car passes behind the gate. Behind the curtain in the little building is black, is black behind there. Like in the Khotan, like in the still life paintings, there's a necessary depth and contrast. And there's differentiation, there's diversity, heterogeneity of the elements, right? So this is all rather important. Okay, now, I said to you that I've been working on this question since 1983. I was in Italy in the summer of 1983 and visited Hadrian's Villa. And this was a model I made when I came back to Cooper to start my DP undergrad year. It's a model of Hadrian's Villa. And why is it made this way? It has little straps of metal. They're like springs, so they push against each other. So the maritime theater pushes against the triclinium, you know what I'm saying? So they are holding together, but they're not deformed, right? That was the thesis. So, you know, I didn't know, and no one knew that John Haydick, our dean, was making this project a year from then. So what I'm doing is not a copy of John Haydick, my teacher's work, because John Haydick did not do that work at that time. And this is his project that he developed while I was, this is, you know, the second part, the second term, it's called the Victims Project. And he came into the studio and he sh said, everyone, gather around. I'm going to demonstrate to you the most important planning principle of the 20th century. That's pretty big. And uh, so he, what did he do? Everyone, of course, super, a little marveling, he took the roll of tape. He took the pencil pointer sharpener and he put it there and they touched. And he took this thing and he put it there and they touched. I said to him, Dean Haydick, well, I'm drawing this right now. He said, Lynch, you didn't date it. That's, that's, that's the truth. So, so there's, this is my thesis model, okay? I don't want to dwell in it. I've never shown this to anybody. This is, you're the first audience to have ever seen this. I made a model of a factory town. What I did is I figured out, I just took this guess that if I stuck blocks to the underside of a sheet of glass with mineral oil, they could slide and not fall down. And then inspired by the Gaudi model, you know, the funicular model, I made these loops of string and I said, well, in a factory town there's attraction and repulsion. The owner is obviously slightly repulsed there's an attraction between the places that people live and the canteen. And so I made a network. These blocks are hold-ins, right? They're not singular. This is not all the way there, right? This is on the way. And then I put the, the little weights on the strings, and lo and behold, God damn it, it worked. They moved and slid and came into the plan. And I thought, God, I, I didn't have to design that plan. It designed itself. So. Now, the project I was doing in Bologna that I showed you was one of the last experiments in a collaboration that I call the Analogical Laboratory. And remember I was saying I wanted to give you a sense of another architectural culture, another time. Uh, in 1984, I graduated and one of my teachers, Don Wall, he said, you should meet this other student who also just graduated and work together, work on a project. And he proposed a project uh, to work on Edward Sagan, the uh, psychologist's uh, research. 
Well, I can't get into that, but some people here know Sig Answorth. And so what do we do? We met every evening for uh, five years, <laughs> every weekday. <laughs> God. And uh, that's us doing an experiment in the New Jersey Meadowlands. So the first thing we, I want to say is what our methodology was, okay? We were not scientific and we were proud of it. So uh, we worked in a way you could call pataphysical, I guess, um, where uh, we would make something, we'd make, an, we'd make a hypothesis about what we called society. At the time, I didn't have any hesitation to use the word society. We made a hypothesis and then we made up a, a machine. And we drew correspondence between aspects of the machine and aspects of the hypothesis. By the way, this also has never been talked about. I've never presented this work. We were so proud that we never showed it to anybody. <laughs> God. Anyway. So, and then we ran the machine. And whatever the machine did allowed us to revise the hypothesis, okay? So it was without logic analogical, and it was by analogy, analogical. So we called it an analogical laboratory. So the first thing we made was a tank of lighter fluid. <laughs> That's a cooling coil inside it. And we put little slips of brown paper on top of the lighter fluid and we lit them. And they acted like wicks. And they piloted themselves around the top of the water. Uh, not water, uh, lighter fluid. So here's a little sequence, okay? The little flames moving around. And they did things. They ran into each other. Some sent others to the bottom of the tank. But they're feverishly moving across the surface of the tank. Okay, now well, here's what we said. We said, ah, this, of course the hypothesis came first. This is a model of Production proper, the activity of production. Think of Negri and think of Homo Faber, or think of capitalism. This is the field of production from the point of view of production proper, agents of production. They claim the whole territory, they're, they're running around because they frankly believe that it is their territory to be entrained into the activity of production. So. They are presuming ubiquity, and they're also more or less presuming autonomy. They each one's doing what they want to do, and they bump into each other. They don't really know why, right? McDonald's doesn't really know what Burger King is going to do, right? They just bump into each other. So this was only obviously half of the story, because from the point of view of those who do not wish to be colonized, that is not the story at all. This is not the field of production, right? If you live in a village in Africa or you have a fishing fisherman in Indonesia, you don't really believe that you are part of the global field of production. So what is this other perspective? It's the same event, but from another perspective, right? And so we said, we're going to take an activity and we're going to cut it in half artificially. We'll make two tanks. We will say that they are both images, representations of the same event, of an attempt. On the left, we'll say it's an attempt of the agents of production to induct subjects into the field of production. On the other side, it's that which doesn't wish to be induced, resisting being induced. And we don't have to use the names for it because that side would be the side that doesn't have its own name. And those of you who've read Deleuze, uh, Anti-Oedipus, you can say that's the side of the desiring machines attacking the body without organs. So what happened? The little plates push against the spiny, you know, they're wick, they're on fire, so they're moving around, they're propelled. They start to spin around the spiny plate, they push it, and we, we're sitting there, we're interpreting what's going on. So, now, before we get too bogged down, because this is going, going to be way impossible for me to give the whole lecture. God. So, um, 
Some of you may have read this quote recently from Hannah Arendt in relationship to Russia's announcement that they have taken the city of Kiev on the second day of the war. Uh, the, uh, Hannah Arendt is saying, from a view of ideology, totalitarian ideology, lies are just provisional truths, right? It's just a matter of time. If your goal is totalitarian control, then it's just a matter of time. So we can claim that, for instance, the Moscow subway is the only subway in the world. Why? Because we will soon destroy the others. So uh, this is not funny, because uh, we see exactly this uh, mind. And this is the mind of production, right? Claiming the territory, the field of production. The Congo is there for the oil. And, but the problem is that this kind of arrogance isn't confined to economic activity. It's built in to our way of thinking. Because we, if we follow this Descartian line, we don't simply experience the world. We comprehend it. And what I was saying before is we have encounters. We encounter the world. Think of the old image of the rays of vision meeting the light reflected from the object, right? This double motion, this exchange is the basis for the um, understanding, right? But obviously this is incredible arrogance built into this as uh, Levinas points out. So if we're gonna answer this question, well, what do, what do, how do singularities they're not part of a hierarchy. They're certainly not entrained within the system of production. How do they hold together? It's not through exchange. Systems of exchange, if you stop and think about it, God, they're so... They're, we assume that they're, they're, they're given, right? Everything is supposed to be a matter of exchange. You gave me that, I will pay for it. Uh, maybe there's a delay, in which case I owe you. But there's another kind of understanding, which we can barely even call economy, where you give this to me, and I give something to someone else. Or you take something from me, and in return, I give to you. And if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, not as a religious text, it's describing a community, a society, or not a society, a community, where this other kind of logic, which is not the logic of exchange, would hold, right? Left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing is a perfect example of a non-relation between different entities. Okay. So now, in what ways can a work of architecture manifest singularity? That's kind of the question I've been waiting for. I do see some people yawning, I'm shocked, because to me this is so exciting. Um, I wonder why. Uh, in all of these ways, this question that I said is like my red thread question is of significance. Now in terms of citing, like I said, with Ingrid Reeser, there's a long conversation about that. Uh, but we'll go through this list, okay? Now. For each one, I'll give an example from history and then one of my own work, okay? So the Chinese students know this, the Wang Ming Wang, the, the Garden of Gardens that was destroyed by the French and English in 1840. Uh, the most incredible artifact that architects have ever made. A landscape of gardens and landscapes each one with a name. If you read uh, the Chinese, uh, if you read this uh, story of the stone or dream of the red uh, chamber, everything has a name. And like I said, the singularity, everything that has a proper name is singular. So this is perhaps the garden of perpetual peace. And the whole place is built up out of this. And it's not an abstraction, okay? These are not like abstract places. In the book, the novel, there's an incredible description of walking through an imaginary Chinese garden. It's endless, one incredible reality after another. The thing I'm emphasizing is that although it's constructed, it's real. 
So now we'll look at my example, okay? This is a project in North Sharping. Uh, it's a, here I can use a pointer. Here, in North Sharping. A little spur, a little rocky spur in this, south of the Motala River. And uh, this place has been a place for summer homes and uh, actually far farms in the 18th century, summer homes in the 19th. There was a international ex exposition or national exposition there in 1907. Then it kind of became surrounded by industry. The, ro the river became industrially streamlined and rerouted. And this is the way it is now. It's just an artifact left over. And we have set up, my partners and I have set up a video cameras there for over a year. We have continuous video footage of this place. So we have like 40 terabytes already of data. And what are we going to do? We can't look at that data. It would take two years to look at two years worth of data. But I can't go into all the details. But at any rate, here's one year, okay? This is noon at 24 times of day. Uh, times of year of this little rocky outcropping, okay? This place that I have spent more time at than almost any other place other than where I live. And of course I love this place. And of course to me it's an important place. But why? It is just what it is. It's just a scrap, I guess. So the first thing that uh, I did was map all the human and animal paths, and then all the exact locations of the trees, okay? Like to give respect to everything that actually is there. And then working with uh, my partners, uh, who are um, uh, Anna Asplin, the dancer, Martin Hedeshu, who's a urban planner uh, from North Shopping, and Mats Nordahl, who's a data scientist, who's gonna help us look at that two years worth of data. Uh, we make proposals for paths and in, 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 in interventions or adjustments to the landscape so that it can become itself, not to change it, but so that it will rise to its own occasion. And so these are the different things that we're imagining doing. Of course, it's adjusting as we're going along. Here's some of the details that we have been talking about, including benches that register certain gestures that arose in that particular place. So they're just, you can also just sit on these benches. And then a uh, viewing pavilion that will look out over our place, our site, and it will gather that. And if you know the, uh, the, idea, uh, uh, the idea of rhythm analysis, um, that rhythm analysis is the idea of a place that you can just sit and understand the rhythms, tempos of this place. And by the way, uh, some philosophers say that only through that kind of intimacy and patience can you claim to have any kind of ecological awareness. Because if you don't stop and look and slow down, then you're, you have nothing to do with that reality. So we're designing different... Uh, details. And for instance, this is that rock outcropping. And I want to put these very delicate railings on the outcropping as if someone once was there, as if there once was something of value there. And uh, so with rapid prototyping, we can make this. Now at the scale of an ensemble, I already gave you the example of Hadrian's Villa, most of us know Campo Marzio, the Piranesi, which was inspired by Hadrian's Villa. There's Dominican uh, Sisters uh, Project by Lou Kahn, which was inspired by the same. There's Hadex Project, right? These are all examples of holding together of singular elements at the scale of what my old teacher, Diane Lewis, called architectural urbanism. Clusters, organizations of buildings planned together. So this is a project that I did in 1995 with, with 
many, many wonderful people helping me. Uh, it was for a competition for an art museum in Tallinn. And you can see this arrangement of bars, right? Gallery bars connected underground, forming courtyards. And with the space between the vaults, there's an interior vault in each of these kind of bars, and then an upper roof. The angle, as we know, the sun angle is really low. So you don't need to bring light in, you don't need a glass roof. So each of the vaults is made with a lamella structure of beams. But the thing about this is each one of those bars has a different lamella structure. And the inclination of those components, they're all on edge seen from one point of view. Do you know what I mean? Like isometrically, you can rotate them, you'll see the sides, the sides, the sides. boom. From a certain angle, only the edge. That corresponds to a moment and summer solstice. So the sun will go through and anoint, I mean, this is literally the way I think of it, anoint each of these galleries in succession on uh, the longest day of the year. And so I think of Jakob Boehme, I think of that Sol Blinten Po Kapper Shalan. That's that moment, right? These are not stick diagram drawings. Those are elevation drawings. But from that angle, you only see the edge of the beams. Okay, building as an entity. I'm not going to talk about this because if you're interested, I have many Instagram posts on this looking at Leverance. Because for me, he understood singularity better than any other architect. And frankly, he's the most famous architect in the world. And he knows what he's doing. And I think that's great. So I'm not going to talk about that. But I'll give you one example of my own work. Uh, this was a project when I was working with uh, Lydia Song. And we had an office in China. We did a project for a uh, forest preserve in Chongqing province. And uh, we had a very humble program. It's a campground facility. Uh, the families wanted to go camping. They wouldn't, they wouldn't rough it. They would come and they put their car and then they'd take an electric cart and go to their house or they would pitch their tent. So this is the valley. It's, it's a karst landscape. There's a lot of undulations. That's the complex, very simple structure. And the thing I want to point out is oh, this. Because what does Leverance do? He makes things imperfect, intentionally. Because that way they can't become types. They can't become abstractions. It's intentional why he shipped the windows on the insurance company building so that they're not a grid. Because there's no idea of a grid. He, he, he eliminated the idea. So here there's a similar kind of dent What happens there is a change in elevation, in plan, in function, in circulation. All of those work together at this dent, like a dent in a car. I think of it the same way. And um, you can see it on the right, on the right there. And all of those different inflections actually work together. They're harmonized. So it'd be like if you dented your car and you said, God, that's great. I can use that as a cup holder. I can put my cup there. Americans would think that's very funny. You're, you're not laughing. So, and then within the project, many details, and uh, I don't have time to talk about why are there three, when in Chinese you call the dwarf columns within the truss. And then some other ideas of this truss for the multi purpose room. Sometimes it's nice to use phrases that have no poetics at all. And uh, other details. A revision of those same details for the framing, which was inspired by this very interesting thing I came across that in Chinese, old Chinese architecture, they use straps. The interesting difference between Japanese and Chinese. These are bronze straps to tie beams together. So my detailing is of these straps to hold the different components together. In its interiority, 
like I'm saying, a mood is always singular. The tea house is the paradigm of the construction of a mood through many of those techniques I was pointing out, chiaroscuro, construction of depth, differentiation, lack of order, uh, of a regulating order, overriding order. And uh, some of the Japanese types like this, uh, this, I had an incredible one week trip through Japan uh, visiting uh, key buildings in the history of developing history of Japanese architecture. This is uh, the first example of the Shoin Zukuri type, which, I, why am I bringing up? Because this, if you're going to talk about a type, you notice that that's kind of alien territory for this lecture. But if you're going to talk about a type, talk about this kind of type. Because this type is defined by having a tokenoma. If you want to be having a building of this type, you make a niche of a certain kind, a tokenoma. You have a certain set of staggered shelves in a cloud-like formation. Chigadana. You have a built-in desk, and you have decorated sliding doors. You put that together, you have this type. So this is phenomenal that the type can arise, I'm sorry, that the singularity can arise through the type. And so I'll just give you one image of one of my projects in China, which was hyper differentiated. Everything was custom made. Everything was in some sense determined. And then how does it hold together? Why are those columns with those walls? Why is the marble with the ceramic tile. I think it holds together. The question is if it creates a mood. Okay, in its detailing, Scarpa is the master of singular elements brought into holding together and brought into relation at the scale of the detail. God, I think this is exactly what he was interested in doing. This is my favorite detail of all. This is the container, it's made of a, I think it was a bronze donut and a bronze egg beater brought together to hold this torchere over the, the uh, altar at Brown Vega Cemetery. And this kind of thinking I definitely have followed in my own work. This is a studio for Madeline Hatz, a large studio for Madeline Hatz. Okay, that's one hour has passed. Okay, so I guess I should wrap it up. Huh? Okay, so anyway, don't worry though. So this, I'm thinking of this in the line of that uh, uh, Scarpa detail. And then at the scale of the individual element. This is where we get to buildings and trees. <laughs> because the tree is the paradigm of the singular element. And if you can maintain that character of its singularity in its presence within a work of architecture, then you have the singularity most clear. And so many of you know that in the tea houses there's this column that's chosen for its irregularity, Daime Bashira column. And so I have spent three years now figuring out how to make a Daime Bashira column with conventional methods of frame construction. So how to integrate the irregular roundwood elements into regular construction. This is the secret detail, no longer secret. Uh, incorporating a buttress or a studio that maintains its character because the ceiling the insulation of the roof is on the outside. The insulation of the walls is on the inside. A lot of details, very special details, and a relationship to the, in its effect to the uh, Japanese architecture. Uh, detailing, I can't talk about. History, I can't talk about. The method requires a special jig table, which holds the the round wood and allows you to make these different cuts in it. 
And it needs a crane because a tree can weigh two tons, right? And uh, with this system, I can make all different kinds of joints for many different projects. The pavilion in North Sherping is one. Uh, prefabricated small structures, Atta Falls Hoos is another. Uh, here's some details I can't talk about. Prefabricated two-story structure. Okay, I click, 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 click. Uh, how do you detail an exposed timber? Everyone knows you shouldn't do this, right? Expose the timber. But if you look at a traditional bell tower here in Sweden, they use this method of the shingles, the tarred shingles. Okay, I can't talk about all the details. The foundation detail is the key detail. Another project with round wood. An old, the old, the last log house in this part of Sermland. Uh, falling apart, collapsing, uninhabitable. The ceiling height is, I can't walk in it without smacking my head. So what we're going to do is add a, another course of timbers and then we'll restructure the roof so that the entire structure doesn't sit on the old walls which are collapsing and they're actually completely hollowed out in places. But they'll sit on, you see the little round, the little round posts so it'll be a structure inside the other structure with the airspace between. And then incrementally built, the round wood will be what defines the interior and then the windows can use that deep relief to create embrasures for the window openings. And then there's other things that I'm showing you for the first time, things that I'm working on, methods of using this jig I came up with to develop other methods, less energy, efficient, energy intensive ways to make a uh, uh, glue lamp. So, slide. Um, I'm showing you things I've never shown. I don't know why it took me so long. But the last things I didn't show because I thought, God, I have intellectual property here. I'm gonna, I gotta protect this. I'm not gonna show anyone. But. Uh, the possibility of developing these things, making these structures, all of these things I'm going to make or we're going to make if you're interested. So my proposal is that we'll make a Facebook, Instagram group, Friends of Wood. You're all welcome. And what can you contribute? If you are interested in wood and you love wood, that's great. If you have tools, you have expertise, you can criticize my details, that's great. And eventually we'll make some group source projects and we'll realize some of these projects together. Okay, and by the way, that it will be a kind of temporary community. Thank you. Thank you so much for a fantastic lecture. Uh, we will open it up to the floor a bit and see if there is any questions. I myself, I have one about the uh, project of singular. No, I just hope that someone will ask a question. Okay. Okay. Good. Yes. I, I guess when you make a project there is you you actually you always aim to to obtain this quality of singularity but there is there is there like a so so then you you reach uh, the question of process and so my first question is is there like in in the in aiming for a singularity is there a generality in the question of process can you okay. can you have a general process and does that at some point have like a drama curve? Is there a pivotal point where, where the project goes from general to a God, singularity? A I mean, you come from a, from a bunch of references maybe entering a project. And, but then I guess, you know, through this searching there, that you might reach the pivotal, is there a pivotal point? But or you're speaking from experience, obviously, because your question shows that you know that this is what happens. I mean, it's such a beautiful question because it's, God, yes. Uh, or maybe not, because by the way, you can choose your 
virtues, right? When I say singular, I don't mean weird. You know, I don't mean like eccentric. That's why the word is so helpful. It's not about being different than anything else. You can, you can be almost invisible, right, in your architecture. It's not about being uh, one of a kind, right? That's not the meaning. But I do agree with you that this is an aspiration. We all know it. And how do you get there? And is there a pivot point? God, I feel like crying because there is a pivot point. This is why we do our work as architects, because of that moment. When you know that moment, then you know why we love our discipline. Because we're not just fulfilling a service. And I say this to my students, it's kind of the mysticism of design education, that after that point, everything is in your favor. Anything that's done, the client can change the size of the project, they can take away 20% of your budget, they can change the site, <laughs> and your project will get better. How is that? And it is exactly that. Uh, uh, Kiesler, Friedrich Kiesler, he made this very funny diagram about a uh, uh, creative process. It's all these lines, you know, pseudo-rational lines coming in, they all come in, they all converge, they all go, we're boing, boing, and they go through this point, and then they all go somewhere else. I mean, I have to think he had a sense of humor. Because at that point, there's no determinability, right? So, but you have to have that aspiration. You know what I mean? If you just want to do a good building, God bless you. That is incredible in itself. Singular thing is indifferent to category. A good thing fulfills the category. So they're not reconcilable. A follow-up question. I guess it's a yes or no question. Uh, do you think you ever achieved a singularity in your project? You don't have to say which project. You can of just course. say yes. Of course. That's why I'm showing you. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions? But I, I thank you, Peter. This was so incredibly inspiring. And um, I'm co uh, it makes so much sense, actually, to me and to, I think, my students as well, okay. um, the way we work um, in Sydney. Um, I wish you had had time to talk more about the, the, the column and the beam structure in Madeline Hatt's uh, studio because I'm totally fascinated by that. So if you just had a few words to say about that because I'm so intrigued by it, it and, and how, because that's to me entering into some kind of negotiation, right? It's, it's somehow negotiating um, and I, I, I'm, I don't know, uh, I just wonder how you did it. Um, do you know the one? I know what you mean, I just can't believe I jumped over it. No, it, it was there, in, you had two images of it, it was later. What happened? It's hiding. Uh, maybe it doesn't exist anymore. That's really weird. Oh, I know where it is. Okay. I know, I know it. Just uh, filed under a different heading. Okay. Okay. So, why is this thing this way? <laughs> I hope you ask that question because if you think it's just whatever, like God, he just piled wood up, who cares? That would really be uninteresting, right? Because we do have to make things that are for a reason, right? Uh, but the question is, what reason? <laughs> so, I'll use the pointer. This building, this is a renovation, an interior of a barn building. Uh, the, the original building itself was built in a number of layers, stages. So it, it was impure from the beginning. So the first building had 
posts, and then a roof. And then when they built an extension in like the 19th century, they made big barns in the 19th century, and then they ran the roof over this, this old the original part, but they, they made the post not align with that post. They didn't care. There was a floor in between, right? Do you know what I'm saying? There was a floor. They just did what they wanted to do. It's not done with love. It's done out of expedience. So when we remove the floor, we have two columns that don't match, right? And obviously you have a number of problems. You have bracing problems besides the load transfer problem. So we made a... Uh, transfer beam here, it transfers from there to there. Oops. Sorry. It transfers from under that post to above that post. And obviously there's going to be eccentric load. So, but by the time that beam is extended over here and tied back, the eccentric load is nothing. You can just hold it with your finger. You know what I'm saying? So that's why that's extended out. And then, that's not enough to brace the roof. There's no lateral bracing at this point, right? Like that column in itself can't support the roof. So we add a second column here, right? That's a new column. It needs to be braced because it's so thin. It's a tree that's been debarked. We did that ourselves. It needs to be braced in this direction. You know, if you brace a compression, you have to do it in both directions. The other direction is braced in this direction. Do you know what I mean? That tie beam, which holds the building from spreading, is also the brace for the new columns in that plane. So that's why it's the way it is. And as an added bonus, we could jack up the, the roof, which was collapsing, because this functions like a jack. Do you know what I mean? You can see it more clearly in the next one. The eccentricity is large enough that we can pry it up and we stuck in blocks of wood, we pried it up and we, we got the roof up to level. Four has personality. I, I love the character of this I, and, and also because it's so, it's like a contraption to me. And I just love contraptions. Thank you, Peter. I would have a question to you for some projects that uh, I know of you and uh, I have been wondering how did that happen that uh, you designed them in this way and uh, which project it's, um, the project of the interior I think in uh, uh, in China for instance this is something which uh, is uh, extremely interesting and uh, is very different from uh, anything that I have seen before. So I was wondering like okay. how, for instance, this one, but also the gate that you have at in North Shopping, yeah. that is the shape that uh, you got and how, how did you come with it? How accidental was it or how much with the feelings or how the gate or the bench? I didn't um, know. I think it's oh, the, the, ga the gate. The, the railing? The, the, no. the railing on the... Oh, the railing. Okay, so good. It, just small details okay. like this. But this is uh, nice. These Peter? kind of questions are nice to ask because they're fun to answer. Um, this was a house for a industrialist. Someone who was so open-minded. They wanted me to make a house, uh, Lydia Song and I, to make a house for them. Well, they would have a lot of social activities. So it's more of a social thing than an intimate project. And this lower level was uh, a room for social activity. So it was just a big, bare, concrete, empty room. By the way, when, it was, when we arrived there first, it was full of dirt. It was like a land art installation because in order to get through the building regulations, they filled it with earth so that it wouldn't meet the floor area. There is no floor there. And then after they got their approval, they dug out the earth. So it was a big empty room. We knew where you're entering from because the elevator went down and the stair went down. So then I traced over the course of a few evenings with chalk 
I trace these two curving lines coming from the entrance into the room based on how the space would unfold. So as you're walking, if you walk by a curving wall, then you literally will see the thing unfolding. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's something you can choreograph if you, if you will, 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 will have the time. You can say, I want that to open up at that speed, and then I will be in the room. And so that's these curves. These curves are laid out one on one, and the Chinese craftsmen, so fantastic. They built it the next day. Boom. You draw it, boom. And the tiles we had made, custom tiles, slip cast glazed tiles. And I could tell you stories, we'd be here really late about why they're arranged the way they are. I think you don't have time for that. But you know that on a doubly curved surface, the cove, where it bends, that's part of a torus, right? It's, you can't tile that with a plain tile. So that the, the tiles rotate as they go up the curve because they have to expand their area that they claim in order to tile the surface. And then um, I just want to tell you one story, okay, about this tile work. You know, John D. Rockefeller couldn't have a place like this because no one would make it. No one would do it. They think you're insane making custom tiles and putting 5,000 of them in. But they did it, and they asked me if I was happy with it. I was happy. They said, that's good, because our hands are bleeding from doing the grouting. But they were proud of their work. And they're proud of this floor. Who would do that here? Who would do that with that much passion? Now, the other question you asked was about the... Okay. Why is this the way it is? What's going on? Oh, God. I don't want to take up a lot of time. But let's just say that if you have three waves, three waves, then you can make a like three waves out of sync, will cover all of the openings along the top rail, along the bottom, in between. You know what I'm saying? Like if you go along uh, Long Holman and you see the railing there, it's very beautiful, it's where this idea came from. It's just two wa waves in sync. And that's why they need the top and bottom rail, to hold it together and to keep a child from falling through in different places. But with three, you can do it. And you can see that the way the rail terminates to the left here, it terminates the way like a sound terminates. Like one wave goes all the way to its conclusion. They're out of sync. The next wave comes to its conclusion. You, you see what I mean? That's why it has this feathered edge. And then in terms of the detailing, how do you hold this together? This is Sweden. No one is going to do this thing custom like with a little hammer. They're going to give you 25 minutes and they're going to try to do it. So, uh, and that's the way it should be. I'm not criticizing. That's respectful to the laborer also. So, the elements are all pre-finished. You're not going to paint on site. And that means the connections can't disturb the finish. Do you know what I mean? Like if it's powder coated, you can't like drill a hole in it or weld it. So these clips are made of two uh, we call uh, you know rapid prototyped clips that can flex a little. They're aluminum. I don't want to go into all the details, but they can clip around. And and when two of them are put back to back with this rubber, uh, butyl rubber fitting, they'll never come apart because each one that was a little flexible when they're together is not flexible at all. And then there's two pop rivets that hold the whole thing together. And you can do rapid prototyping of butyl rubber, so, or some type of durable rubber. So this is a very practical detail. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. I think we have to wrap up there. Thank you for a beautiful lecture.